morning, C.N. Jenkins and community. What a joy it is to greet you on this Lord's Day. Welcome to our 9 o'clock worship service. Welcome to those who will be watching this service later on. For this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. The scriptures tell us to shout for joy to God, our creator, to lift up holy hands and to give God thanks for all that God does in and through our lives. We say in our church that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. But we take it one step farther and say God is great and greatly to be praised.
eternal God, we thank you that you still heal the hurts of our hearts. And we pray, dear Lord, as we worship you today, that you will be that counselor, that you will be that comforter. And God, you will wipe away every tear. And God, you will restore the joy which is our strength. Thank you, God, for all who gathered to be a part of this service. We thank you, God, for all who will not just watch, but will hear your word and apply your word to their lives. Speak now, God, that your service may hear. Move in a way that we will all be changed by the proclamation of truth. Eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts continue to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, let the church say, Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Great things God has done. We thank God for our musical staff and for those psalmists who led us in that hymn. Come ye this consulate, most importantly, most appropriate hymn in the life of our church. Today, if you have your word, I invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, reading just one verse from that book, the New International Version translation, Deuteronomy chapter 36, verse 6, and then prepare for Romans 8, chapter 37. But it is our tradition to read the word together, and if you are at your home or on the track or wherever you may be today, I invite you to read this word, at least hear it from the written power of God. The word says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And from the New Testament, we turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 37, from a New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The word says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I call your attention to this passage from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 6. For the Bible says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. With the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I invite you to work and walk with me as we preach today on our subject, not without a struggle not without a struggle. <clears throat> My friends, if there was ever a time that you needed to have faith, and if there was ever a time when you needed to have something worthwhile to believe in, I believe now is the time. Church family, if there was a time that you ever needed to be encouraged, and if there was ever a time when you needed to be reminded of just where your strength comes from, I believe now is the right time. For I believe that now is the right time to pray and now is the right time to protest. For now is the right time to march and now is the right time to map out a plan. For now is the right time for old men and old women to see visions and now it's the right time for young men and young women to have dreams. For now it's the right time to get hyped and now it's the right time to learn your history. For it's the right time, my friends, to resist arrest but it's also the right time to register to vote. It's the right time to post on social media if that's your thing. But it's also the right time to protect from looters the handful of grocery stores and pharmacies that still remain in the black community to serve people of color. Yeah. My friends, 
now is the right time. For if there was ever a time when you needed to be encouraged, and if there was ever a time when you needed to know where your strength come from, I believe now is the right time. Somebody ought to type amen in the chat box right there. And, and, and how can you say now is the right time, preacher? Well, you see, since May 25th, some 20 plus days ago, marches have developed into a movement. Politeness has advanced into protests. Anxiety is now painted into artwork. Frustration has fueled the masses. And of all the demanding challenges and demanding change that people are screaming on a unified voice, now is the right time. For you see, since May 26, the day the video was released of the public lynching of George Floyd, more than 400 cities representing all 50 states have witnessed street protests and have a rainbow of skin color shouting Black Lives Matter because now is the right time. And please know, my friends, that I don't say this frivolously, discounting the ongoing efforts of civil rights organizations, social justice advocates, and proponents of equality who have stayed in the trenches, never abandoning the call, and who have continued to be fighting for police reform long before May 25th. But hear me with patience, y'all, because when I say now is the right time, I'm trying to move from anger to action. I'm trying to pull some redemption from the riots. I'm trying to offer help from an appearance of hopelessness. And I'm trying to clarify demands from the demonstration. And so here it is, now is the right time. For now is the right time that we recognize that to eradicate the ills of systemic racism, we can't go illing one another just because some folk don't talk the way you talk. So if they dangle a participle or crucify a verb or drop the F-bomb and speak in broken sentences, trust me, friends, if you don't understand the streets do be know what they be talking about. Now is the time, my friends, to let the world know that taking a knee by Colin Kaepernick cost him his job, but it never caused a man to lose his life. Now is the time, church, to tell the world about Samuel Hammond and Henry Smith and Delano Middleton. Three students killed by police on the campus of South Carolina State College, February the 8th, 1986. Why? Because they stood up against racism. They stood up against segregation, and they protested to integrate a downtown bowling alley. But the owner of the bowling alley felt he was above the law, and when you are feeling you are above the law, you will call in federal troops. When you feel you are above the law, you will try to quiet those who give a peaceful protest. When you feel you are above the law, as they did in South Carolina in 1968, they called in 70 armed federal troops, and they killed these three students, wounding 28. And you know the rest of the story. For the nine officers were charged, but they were acquitted, and nobody served any time. You see, now is the time, my friends, when we need to let the young folk in the street know that it wasn't just a lunch break on a lunch hour that the sit-in took place. It wasn't just those four students from North Carolina A&T who took time off for lunch and sit at that Woolworth counter. No, it lasted not a day, not a week, not a weekend, but for six months. Six months, students walked from the campus of 
A&T. Six months students were called names. Six months students were cussed out. Six months students were humiliated by angry marks. Six months they brought their homework to the lunch counter. They brought their friends to the lunch counter for six months doing whatever it needed to be done, y'all, to break the corporate backs of Woolworth. You see, you've got to understand it's going to take some time to bring about change. That's what Frederick Douglass said in that infamous quote. He says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. If never, it never did, and it never will. Now is the time, my friends, to let the current movement know that it was 381 days of getting up early, 381 days of carpooling, 381 days of sharing a ride and walking to work, 381 days of walking to the grocery stores, then walking home with your groceries because you boycotted the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Now is the time, my friends, to affirm and to embrace all of God's children. Embrace all of God's children, male and female, straight and gay, lesbian and trans, queer and undecided. Now is the time that we welcome all of God's children. For you see, if it had not been for a black gay man from Chester, Pennsylvania, we would not have the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. If it had not been for a black gay man from Chester, Pennsylvania, we would not have the advice given to Dr. King on the Civil Rights Bill. If it had not been for a black gay man, the chief architect of the March on Washington, we never would have heard Dr. King preach those famous words, I have a dream. Now is the time to embrace all of God's children. For now is the time to demand for substantial investment from corporate America into HBCUs, starting in the tune of $107 billion. And where does this come from, Reverend? That's $1 billion apiece for the 56 private HBCUs and 51 public HBCUs. That's $107 billion to endow their scholarships, to endow their buildings, to endow their institutions. Now is the time, my friends, to demand from state elected fi figures, particular black leaders, to lead legislations and to find uh, the funding for the five state historically black colleges in North Carolina and fund them at the same level of the 11 WPWIs who get the same tax dollars from the same citizens in North Carolina. Now is the time, my friends, to demand that Mecklenburg County Commissioners, the City of Charlotte, the Fire Department, the Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, the District Attorney's Office, the School Board, there's time for them to deposit no less than $5 million into the black-owned bank, the only black bank in Charlotte. And why is that so particular? Because there's never been a time in the history of Charlotte Mecklenburg that all those all those community groups that I've mentioned from the commission to the city council to the fire department to the sheriff department to the police department to the district attorney to the school superintendent y'all all people those who leading those organizations should be able to sing lift every voice and sing all three verses without looking at a hymn book now is the time now is the time, y'all, that we demand that every church and every preacher who has the unmitigating gall to hit the streets and scream Black Lives Matter, it's now time for you preachers to lead your congregations to put some green church money in a black bank. Now is the time, preachers. 
Now is the time not only for us to walk to the, the government center and walk to the police station, but go to 101 Betty's Ford Road and invest because if black lives matter, green money must fall on some black lives. You see, understand, freedom is never more than one generation away. One generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in their bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like to be free in the United States. Now is the time. And now is the time, my friends, for us to understand that we can't accomplish what God wants us to accomplish without a struggle. You see, in these last nine verses of the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, Paul further discusses the eternal security of a believer. In these verses, Paul raised questions and gave answers concerning the eternal security of a believer. In essence, Paul was certain that he would be saved and that his salvation would not be taken away from him by the grace of Almighty God. You see, the grace of God, my friends, has given Paul something to shout about, and I believe there's somebody watching online right now who can type an amen right there for the grace of God in your life. Somebody can type hallelujah right there for God's grace going beyond your wildest imagination. Somebody ought to give a thumbs up right there, to a high five to somebody watching with you that if it had not been for the grace of Almighty God, you could have been dead. It gone. If it had not been for God's grace giving you a second chance, you could have been wiped off the face of the earth. If it had not been for God's grace showing up in your life, you see, it's God's grace that makes the difference in our lives. You see, Paul explains to us, my friends, is that you're going to have some adversities in life. But to understand that he could not experience anything, nor would you or I experience anything beyond the power of Almighty God. I mean, I just want to pause there for a minute, church, and explain to you my theme, not without a struggle, because I don't want you to miss the context or the pretext of the context of the text itself. The title comes from the book written by Bishop Reverend Dr. Vasti Murphy McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie, as you know, was the first African-American female bishop in the AME church. It was from her writing and from this very pulpit here at C.N. Jenkins that Dr. McKenzie preached words of inspiration and words of liberation and words of affirmation and words of celebration. And in particular, she affirmed to all of God God's children, particular women in ministry, that you would have some struggles, but if you have God on your side, if you have the Lord in your heart, if you have the spirit of transformation on the tip of your tongue, God will see you through. And it is from this theme, not without a struggle, I open up the pages of Romans and I want you to hear what the writer is saying, that number one, one's salvation, one's relationship with God is secure despite what others may say. One's relationship, one's, one's salvation with God, my friends, it is secure despite what others may say. For how can you say that, Reverend? The Bible tells us, it says, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, will not also he deliver us free from our sins? You see, Paul begins this section, y'all, with a question concerning the things that might challenge the Christian life. He answered that the things that might challenge the Christian life are never above the power of Almighty God. Paul was aware, y'all, that as Christians, we can encounter some tough days. As Christians, we will go through some dry spells. As Christians, we will have some seasons when it seems like the bottom is falling out. But you have to recognize that what can overcome and what can defeat us and what can bring us down. And he says nothing can overcome the power of Almighty God. 
and somebody watching today, you need to hear what I'm saying as I speak into your home. Somebody listening today need to hear what I'm saying as I speak through your earphones because you need to recognize you can't get through life without a struggle. But if you're faithful over a few things, you become Lord and Master over many things. That's why we got to give a major shout out, y'all, to the new editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar. I'm talking about Metro, Montreal Canadian uh, a native now living in Brooklyn who is the chief of Harper's Bazaar, that Samara Inzar. See, see the, her story is interesting because she didn't get the Harper's without realizing she has to help some people along the way. That's why when she put uh, Lupita and Yungo on the cover of Vanity Fair, that the world couldn't understand how can you put this beautiful black woman on the cover of Vanity Fair because she realized that it's not without a struggle. She didn't get to be the editor in chief until she was able to reach back and help somebody. And somebody hearing me today, God is calling you to reach back and help somebody. God is placing into your spirit. Don't get so high on your own pr propaganda. Did you forget you didn't get there by yourself? We all all stand on the shoulders of men and women whose names are not written in the history book but who spent many times and many nights and many mornings on their knee praying to Almighty God. Paul, my friends, wanted his readers to have such great a sense of assurity that he wrote these words that God is both the giver and the sustainer of our salvation. Hear what I'm saying from the text because Paul wrote to this church, these Roman converts. He wanted them to recognize in verse 33 uh, that the readers are to also understand that Satan will come with you, bringing all kinds of charges against you. But Paul asks you, who will bring a charge against God's elect? You see, it does not matter what the world says about you. It's what's most important, what you say about yourself. Matter of fact, quit listening so much about what other folks say about you. You need to listen to some self-talk about what you say about yourself. I am a child of God. I have been saved. I am redeemed. I am worthy. I am somebody. I, I, okay, you didn't get it. Let me give it to you. You is smart. You is kind. And you is important. And recognize that's what Dr. King said about having that blueprint of your life. Everybody needs to have a blueprint of your life. You don't construct a building without a blueprint. And you need to have a blueprint that's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. A blueprint that's written by the blood of Jesus Christ. A blueprint that says that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Paul, Paul in the text, y'all, he helps us recognize, number two, that secure salvation you have despite anything. You see, the text lit, leads us to know in verses 35, 36, and 37 that we have a secure salvation despite anything. The first one was in despite anybody. The second was despite anything. For it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, verse 36 says, for, they, for thy sake we are being put to death all the day long. Paul is saying, but here it is, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I like that, y'all, because what that says is we're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We're not just to be in the game. We are to play the game by the right set of rules. We're not just to be present, but we're to experience God's presence and take it wherever we go. You see, I like the words of, of the late Miss Coretta Scott King, who said that struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and you win it in every generation. She went on to say that this is what we have not taught young people or older ones for that matter. 
We've got to continue to share that we have a struggle going on. And the struggle is really not ours. Matter of fact, the, the Bible says the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. It's up to us to be faithful over a few things. Us to stand up and not bow down. Us to lift up and not let others put us down. It, it, uh, it's up to us, the children of Almighty God, to do the work that God calls us to do. You see, it is, it is possible sometimes, y'all, for things to distress, to depress us and distress us. It's possible sometimes, y'all, for us to major in the minor and don't, don't major in the major. It's possible for us sometimes to look at the speck in your eye and don't see the two by four in our own eye. But Paul lets it be known that we are more than conquerors. Why? Because the love of Christ that is in our hearts, not without a struggle, y'all, it helps us recognize that Paul is suggesting to us that whatever we encounter, we have the power to overcome. That is why we celebrate General Charles Q. Brown as the Air Force Chief of Staff, promoted this week, confirmed by the Congress, uh, uh, General Brown, y'all, that, 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 that four-star general now leads the entire United States Air Force, but here's what he said, remembering that he's on the shoulders of other folk. He says, I'm thinking about how my nomination provides some hope, but also comes with a heavy burden. I like the way that he put it out there because sometimes people, when they get elevated, they say, I'm not a role model, but in the words of Michelle Obama, sugar baby, because you are elevated, you are now a role model. You have people looking at you. You have people listening to you. You have folk who are following in your footsteps. So whoever I'm talking to right now who's denied the fact that you are a role model, let me just give you a footnote. If God has blessed you, you are are a role model. If God has opened up a door, you are a role model. If God has brought you from a mighty long way, okay, I'm going to give myself a high five. If God has opened up a door and shown you that with him all things are possible, you are a role model. That is what General Brown is saying. He's saying that in the Air Force, I've experienced some tough days and some bad days, some hard days and some trying days, but I'm here because of the grace of all did I say he's also a good alpha brother so that's just a sidebar but that didn't make him God made him who he is God has lifted him up and God has responded to him you see the verb the pretense the verb that Paul declares I am convinced I'm convinced that is a perfect tense verb I I'm convinced that indicates that something occurred in the past but also something is about to happen now. Let me back it up and say that again. Paul is saying, I am convinced that nothing separates me from the love of Almighty God. In the perfect tense, I am convinced. That means I know that if he's done it before, he has shown up, do it again. That's your high five right there. If he's delivered you before, he can deliver you again. If he's answered a prayer before, he can answer the prayer again. If he's opened a door before, he can open a door again. Again, he, he's healed you before, he can heal you again. Not without a struggle, y'all. It, it really leads back to the Deuteronomy passage. And let me lift this up as I take my clothes because I don't want you to forget what Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse Verses 6 through 8 tell us, for Moses is giving the Israelites an exhortation that became God's rallying call to Joshua. Moses, who didn't get into the promised land, had to remind the children in the wilderness that they were going to get there. But Moses had to also encourage Joshua that Joshua, though I may not get there with you, I'm sure my people would get there some way. Joshua, though I may not get to experience 
experience the first black president of the United States of America, I know somebody will go to the polls and make sure that happens. Joshua, though I may not get to all of the liberties and all of the responsibilities that I want to carry out, Joshua, you need to be encouraged. Joshua, you need to be in, you need to be lifted up. Joshua, you need to stay prayed up. You're going to have some struggles, Joshua, but if you keep your faith in Almighty God, Joshua, God will see you through. Here is the good news, my friends, because when you recognize that God has brought you to a point for such as this, not without a struggle, that's why you can say, like the chief master sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Caleb O'Reilly, you see, understand that the, the, the chief master sergeant means he's the highest enlisted a soldier in the Air Force. Now, I told you that the general was the highest officer in the Air Force, but now I'm telling you that the highest enlisted person in the Air Force, they all sing, lift every voice, and sing with some pride. Here is what he said last week. The highest enlisted officer in the Air Force, he says, I am George Floyd. I am Philando Castile. I am Michael Brown. I am Austin Sterling. I am Tamar Rice. He is saying, regardless of the uniform, when I take it off, I've got to struggle. When I take it off, I've got to lift up my ancestors. When I take it off, I am a role model. When I take it off, I have to speak the truth. When I take it off, I have to give back. When I take it off, I have to be an example of God's love and redemption. Recognize this, my friends, that God gives us an opportunity to stand up, to be heard, and to be a strong voice and a witness. I've got to give a major shout out to the quote given on August 26, 1863, given several months after the Emancipation Proclamation given by President Lincoln to reassure the nation with a word picture for Herm, from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Here is what President Lincoln says. He says, we are now like whalers who have been on a long chase. We have at last got the harpoon into the monster, but we must now look how we steer. Or with one flop of his tail, he will send us all into eternity. Think about it, my friends. That in essence, when we are right now at the turning point of bringing down systemic racism, President Lincoln said this, more, more, more than 150 years ago that it's like having a harpoon into a whale. But if we're not careful, it can flip its ugly tail and will send us all into eternity without ever reaching our goal. You see, I like the text because the text reminds us of none other than that great that great stalwart, that great civil rights leader, that great woman from, from, from Norfolk, Virginia, educated at Shaw University, finding herself on the front line with the students in 1960 at the Greensboro sit-in. That, that great leader comes in the voice of none other than Ella Baker. Don't know if you know the Ella Baker story, but it is so phenomenal and so exciting because Ella Baker represents, y'all, that the struggle we have must go on. To be more than a conqueror, Ella Baker says in essence, we're going to face some trials in life of uncertainty, but we must not give up. I like the Ella Baker story, y'all, because the Ella Baker story helps us realize is that there is an anthem, an anthem that we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. You see, Ella Baker was giving us the chant and giving us the voice and giving us the spirit to stand in the midst of, uh, of, a, of an awful ill and awful sickness. Ella Baker and, and, and the foundation of which lifts up her name recognizes this woman born on December the 13th uh, and died on December the 13th, 83 years later, recognize that the power is not in the old folk, but the power is the young folk in the street. 
it was Ella Baker who said that until until that 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 that, that it's important that the killing of black men and black mother's son becomes just as important the killing of white men and white mother's son we will not rest you see it's Ella Baker who helps me realize that we've got a struggle but the struggle cannot end at the end of a weekend the end of June or the end of May we have to lift up the bloodstained banner of Christ against sin for the rest of our lives and it is that I employ upon you today that don't give up on your struggle and don't give up on your cause and don't throw in the towel and don't take a L because God is still moving God is still working and God is still turning things around and now is the right time now is also the right time for somebody to come back to your creator now is the right time, not just because of a pandemic and not just because of social upheaval, but now is the time that God has opened up your heart and opened up your spirit for a place of transformation. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We who believe in freedom shall not rest. Amen. We thank you so much for being a part of this service. Thank you for tuning in. We pray that God's spirit has spoken a word to you today. I invite you, if you're interested, for continue with prayer, to call the church, write us, email us. In the chat box, you can just give your contact information to Reverend Lanson and Dr. Carroll. They'd be glad to contact you. This is real, and we're in some times when we can only do it by the grace of Almighty God. So I pray that you don't give up, don't give out, don't give in. But let God make you more than a conqueror. I love you in the name of the Lord. I pray for you. I wish and pray God's favor to be upon you this day and forever. May the peace of our Lord, may the love of our God, may the fellowship of the sweet communion be with you this day and forever. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week.